everyone. Welcome back to Make It Happen. My name is Dr. Brent Siebold. I lead entrepreneurship and innovation at the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering. And we have this fun gathering every single week, if you can believe it, uh, in Zoom world uh, called Make It Happen. And, and we're here to learn some new tips and tricks in a lot of different domains of innovation. And today, one of the hot ones, uh, pardon the pun, is in the realm of the circular economy, which impacts our, our, our warming planet and all of the craziness that we have to deal with as innovators and technologists. So uh, if you're into making the world a better place, you should also be very tuned into uh, what uh, Alicia knows uh, inside and out, which is circular economy as a mechanism to both create new products and services, but at the same time, uh, clean up the mess that we've made for ourselves as human beings on this little blue planet called Earth. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, say hi to my colleague, Alicia Marseille. Hey, Alicia. Hi, good morning. Thank you for, for having me. I'm excited to, to dive in here. Um, I'm not sure if it's okay or not, Brent, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it'd be great to do this uh, somewhat informally as I go through if you have questions um, to chime in. Is that okay, Brent? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, and I believe you're going to be sharing some slides with us, which is fantastic. Uh, as Alicia is sharing her screen, I'll also mention that Alicia and I have worked together for many years um, in the domain of entrepreneurship and innovation at ASU, now the J. Orrin Edson Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute. Uh, but uh, as I've um, hunkered down with our uh, 20,000 plus engineers, uh, Alicia has uh, supported many of our students in the Rob and Melanie Walton uh, Sustainability Solutions Service. I can't believe I said that. I was, you should have said that. Uh, it's like the longest, longest thing. Yeah. Yeah. So quick Thank bio. I've been, I don't have a, I don't know where my actual bio photo is. So I found this one. Uh, so I've been at ASU for three years. I came um, to, uh, joined a, a team that was a cross appointment between ENI and Walton um, to actually build and manage a circular economy incubator accelerator. It was the first of its kind in its country. And prior to that, I was the director for an SBA, for the SBA funded women's business center for Maricopa County. And then I had my own um, company. I used to work with a democratic group of coffee farmers and export and import containers of raw coffee um, across the US. So definitely an entrepreneur at heart. Um, our primary purpose at Walton is to actually work internally um, with different faculty and staff and, and, and students and taking research and knowledge as it's developing in the university and applying it in public and private settings and different industries to solving some of the uh, global problems that we're facing here, some of our impact. Um, one of our signature programs in the space of circular economy was a multi-year project with the city of Phoenix. Um, called RISEN, the Resource Innovation Solutions Network. Um, it was a mix of research and economic development-based projects. So um, really to work with the city to understand how to um, accelerate circular economy across the region. I'm gonna dive into circular economy concepts here in a second. Um, as you can see on the bottom, that was the impact that the incubator had over the course of about two and a half years working with uh, early stage companies. Um, so this is uh, my favorite economist. Um, if you haven't seen her work, she does a tremendous amount of work actually in the space of innovation. Um, and she really, some of her work in innovation really has resonated with our work at ASU and thinking about how to drive circular economy because it's a very, as you'll see, it's a very complex concept and it, it requires people to think across value chains um, and forces people to actually collaborate to come up with different types of solutions. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yep. So. All right. So um, Walton post risen, we really started to think about how to define circular economy and thinking more about it in terms of an ethical circular economy. You can actually have a sustainable, circular economy where there is no waste, but we've added ethical from the standpoint of um, how do you think about all material inputs, products and resources, 
et cetera, across value chains while you're also improving livelihoods through inclusive economic development. So linear economy, this is a, a really simple graphic that describes a linear economy, really pretty much where we still are. We extract raw materials out of the ground. We manufacture them. There's a whole chain of logistics and supply chain um, systems that deliver the product, the raw materials and end products to different retailers. Consumers use them, and then they dispose of leftover products for packaging, et cetera, that's either uh, recycled or landfilled. Um, I say recycled or landfilled um, from the standpoint that actually um, does anyone know how many or what the recycling rate in the U.S. is by chance? Feel free just to unmute yourself and shout it out. The percentage, how much do you think of the our trash that we actually recycle? 20%. 34. Yeah, so not very high, right? And so um, it's really low when you think about the amount of materials that exist. And actually, plastics is even less. So. Um, for those of you that are familiar with plastics, plastics number one, or what's called PET, like plastic water bottles, we actually globally recycle less than um, 10%. Yeah. Um, the issues around the linear economy, we're going to go through several of these today. One of the main issues is actually related to population growth. So this uh, graph shows us population where it was in 2010. As you can see, the key area to pay attention to here are these concepts of mega cities, the big red circles, cities that have 10 million or more. Um, why do you, does anyone have an idea as to why population growth affects the amount of, of waste or recycling? People consume more products, right? So check out from 2010 to 2050, the red dots, how they change. So population is growing at a massive rate. More people increases the amount of production and the amount of consumption. Um, there's various types of what they call materials in regards to circularity. You've got plastics, you have glass, you have paper, you have e-waste. Um, and how those materials are actually recycled have a big impact, obviously, on uh, not just geography, but the development of end markets and the infrastructure that the countries have in place to actually move the materials to locations to collect them, process them, and where they will actually end up in terms of their end markets. Um, you're going to see some correlation between these graphs. So the upper left-hand graph shows country income groups. So these graphs represent low- and middle-income countries. So you know, the, the countries that have the strongest waste management systems in the upper left-hand um, graph are the blue ones. Um, but then there are also um, similar the amount of energy that's consumed, right? They have a, a consumer base that has a much higher, um, uh, sorry, Brent, you keep putting things in the chat. Uh, Feel free to shout out. It's hard to kind of monitor the chat also, so feel free to, to shout out questions or thoughts as we're going through this. So there's a correlation also between... Sorry, it's, it's mostly me in the chat just uh, causing trouble, so don't worry. Keep going. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm going yeah. gonna to write your name on the board here, Brent. Um, <laughs> so countries that have higher income, while they do have stronger waste management systems, they also produce the most waste. They also have the highest energy consumption of which most of the energy is still not renewable or sustainable based energy. And they also have some of the highest waste outflows. So the upper left hand graph shows uh, waste in regards to food waste. The bottom, bottom left hand quadrant shows the amount of um, plastic waste that's generated. Um, the red indicates the highest generated uh, plastic waste. China, Asia part of that's obviously population driven. Um, and then you can see e-waste. This e-waste chart in the bottom right is something that um, we spent a lot of time in in Walton. The red dots indicate the sources of the waste and the blue dots indicate where the waste ends up. So similar to um, plastic, um, e-waste uh, migrates itself to, uh, towards Asia. 
Um, quick waste facts. Um, right now, there's about 100, 100 billion tons of resource consumed today. And you can see the increase by 2050, more than double. More people, more waste. A key thing to think about this from a resource standpoint, it's the rate of population growth, production and consumption. Um, there are actually not enough Earth to actually sustain the growth. Um, if you're interested in reading further, there's a, a woman um, who taught at MIT. Her name is Danella Meadows, and she uh, was part of a, a, a research uh, team with the Club of Rome that did two rounds of research and what's called limits to growth, which this chart articulates. Um, so not just in terms of not enough resources coming in, but then you think about the waste output. So look at the uh, waste output change by 2050. Um, this is a landfill in India called Ghazipur. Um, another really interesting thing to look up, it's right in the middle of the city. It's supposed to have closed about 20 years ago, but due to not having other landfills that have space and capacity, they keep it going. And then obviously, um, you've heard about the ocean plastics issue. So um, they predict that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2040. Um, and this is what's called one of the trash dryers. Each of the oceans has a trash dryer with the current, the, the plastic material actually um, congregates in certain parts of the ocean. Recent research has shown that actually there's more what they call microplastics at the bottom of the ocean um, than there is floating at the top. They're not sure exactly how much. There are some ASU faculty, though, that have been doing some research in this space. Rolf Holden um, is one of them in engineering. Um, and when you think about it, microplastics are able to get down to a size that is so small, it actually enters into the condensation cycle. So now they're finding plastic in precipitation. They're finding plastic in soil. The other reason why they're finding large amounts of plastics in soil is wastewater treatment facilities take the sludge from, from the treatment and often use it in agricultural practices. But because we're actually now breathing and eating plastics, it's entering into the farm fields also. Hopefully everybody already ate lunch. <laughs> um, so, so waste management in developing countries, if you think about it, waste management can really be broken up into three segments. You have a process of which you collect materials. So in the US, we have, we have trucks, we have bins, they move the materials, they collect them from the household, they bring them to what's called a material, material recovery facility, which is the image on the right. Um, some cities run and operate them, um, otherwise they're run and operated primarily in the US by Republic Services or Waste Management. Um, is anyone shocked to see um, that there are people manually sorting on the right-hand side. I thought that was pretty wild the first time I went to a material recovery facility. It kind of looks like a, a Laverne and Shirley um, image there. Uh, I see Bryson just posted in the chat, microplastics are increasingly found in fish and water. Yeah, um, they are in the food chain. And in the LMICs, the low to moderate income countries, they don't have, actually, a, there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of, uh, actually, let me go back to the last slide. Jennifer just asked a really good question about hand sorting. Um, why do people think they're hand sorting? Before anybody answers, I should um, clarify, Alicia, your, your prior statement. Um, I'm wondering how many people caught your reference to Laverne and Shirley. Oh my God. Hey John, yeah. um, but I, I realized that when I said that. <laughs> yeah. um, That's like so, some TV show, everybody, in case you haven't seen it. Um, why do people think they're hand sorting? Not smart okay. enough. No, I'll jump in. It, it's, it, it's a tricky question, honestly. So. Recycling is based, and I, I didn't actually finish my thought there. So recycling is based on collections and processing. So this is a processing facility where the recyclables come, they're sorted, they're bailed. And then the third leg of recycling systems are end markets. And so traditionally in the US, end markets 
were not actually in the U.S. We were exporting our recycling materials to China. And what was happening in China, for those of you that have heard of the, the China, China ban, China eventually said, we're not taking any more materials. We have enough. And it was also problematic because when the U.S. was sending, you know, huge truckloads of plastics, they would pick out the valuable plastics and then they would dump the rest in the ocean. Um, and so the ban actually, while seemingly really, really terrible initially, is one forcing countries to really think about how to deal with their own waste and also trying to, thinking about um, how to use different types of innovation to drive some of these changes which goes to the hand sorting. Um, there's honestly not a lot of innovation in the space of circular economy. And what's interesting about it is that you have a lot of corporations and municipalities that are, that are really hungry and thirsty for the innovation. Um, there's just not been a lot of research and development in this space. There is a company in Colorado called Amp Robotics that actually has robotic arms that accompanies optic sensors to actually sort materials in these material recovery facilities. The biggest reason why they're not more mainstream is cost. So if you think about it, um, do people know where uh, plastic comes from? Oil. Oil. Petroleum. Right. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Bailey, oil. And what else? Sorry? Gas, too. Natural gas. Yeah, exactly. And so the thing is, is oil is really cheap. And you think about how much it goes into from the recycling standpoint of collecting it, processing it. Um, you know, how do you develop processing systems that can be, that can adapt to um, the fluctuation of commodity pricing um, that can um, adapt to material changes. And think about how much, when you go shopping, how much packaging always is changing and not just in terms of like color and shape, but actually what it's made out of. And then the third component is the end market. You know, how do you develop companies that can actually take the materials and make other products out of them and have that be cost effective? We'll go through some examples here at the end. Uh, Bryson asked, how long until you think the machines that can melt them down into a form of oil that can still be used become reasonable at a large scale? So we actually worked with a company and there was an incubator called Renewology, if this is an interest, um, definitely look up her company. She, so a big part of circular economy developing end market is modularity, designing technology and solutions that are modular and can adapt and expand as the uh, material flows expand or the opportunities expand and shrink back. It decreases their upfront capital investments. So an example, of that is Renewology system is the size of a tennis court. It's a three to $5 million investment. And she processes what's called plastics three through seven, which are things like these bags, right? That have very little value or ability to reuse, chip bags, those types of things. And um, one output is a resin, plastic resin that goes back to Dow. The other output is diesel. Pyrolysis is an old technology, but she's been able to modularize it and shrink it to the point of not just even the tennis court, the size of a pallet her technology fits on. So she's actually working with a waste picker organization now in India on how the women who pick the waste and material can actually um, use that to create another stream of revenue for them. Um, some would argue it's not a circular technology, but it's more of a transitional because you're not keeping the highest and best use. Um, I mean, I personally say if there's no use for the material, then that is a good use in that. So waste management and low to moderate income, it's not just, you know, infrastructure in a lot of low to moderate income countries isn't, you know, their infrastructure waste isn't the only area of difficulty. You have things in regards to water and energy and food systems, but the, the waste management issues in low to moderate incomes is a, is a big one there. So circular economy forces us to think and change from that linear model to one that is circular. How do we, once we extract resources and manufacture, distribute them, use them, how do you collect and process them into something else or connect them to other markets? And that's why the value chain um, becomes really important. I'm going to show you an example of a value chain partnership that has, with a circular economy business model. 
Um, part of this is really challenging. We actually met with an ASU faculty yesterday. They, uh, ASU, Neil Woodbury has been working really hard at the university to actually attract faculty in the polymer um, science area, specifically in chemical and uh, chemistry. There's a lot of chemical engineering and, and chemists that are working on chemical recycling. Um, you know, how do you break down some of the materials to um, more of a molecular level that they could then be rebuilt and redesigned into something else? Um, for the mechanical engineers on the call, mechanically, it is hard because a lot of materials need to actually be broken down chemically. Um, it's also kind of weird to think about mechanically breaking down certain products and thinking about the ocean issues. Um, I think what's also really exciting about circular economy is there's a tremendous amount of global impact and opportunity, especially financially. So it's not just a solution that has a positive impact environmentally and socially, but it actually is, um, presents a lot of economic opportunities as well. So to do this, and this is really what we've started to spend a lot of time on with our work, is getting people to shift paradigms in terms of how they think about not just business models, but how we design products, how they're produced. Um, so you're not just thinking of the, the back end of this economy in terms of collecting and landfilling, the back end and the waste, but on the front end, how do we redesign and produce products and think about them a little differently? How do we also take a systemic approach in, in doing this um, is really key and important. Again, back to that value chain concept. Um, this is kind of the approach, not kind of, this is the approach that we actually take in Walton and working with different entities. You know, how do we collaboratively understand the problems we're trying to solve? How do we map the landscape to understand the stakeholders and their activities? How do we co-design solutions with the entities and then create a roadmap to not just pilot, but then also scale the different types of solutions? Um, really quick for those of you, um, uh, I'm not sure if some of you have done any work in sustainability and systems thinking, so I thought really quick a few slides just to touch base. So circular economy is really based in sustainability in general in terms of systems thinking. Um, and so what is a system? These are two really, and I didn't even know there were so many uh, car fanatics on the call, but this should resonate. So. Um, a system is basically a set of interconnected parts, right, that create a larger whole together. So on top, you've got the car pieces, but it doesn't actually become a car or a system until you put them all together. And a key thing to think about with systems and designing circular-based systems is that there are different parts. They have different types of relationships together. They're organized differently, and there are boundaries. Boundaries being really key. It can get overwhelming when you're starting to think about some of these things. Um, another uh, common image that's used in sustainability courses is um, this elephant. Have any of you seen the three blind men in the elephant, elephant image before? No, not so much. So the, you know, they're all looking at the elephant and different pieces, but they don't realize it's an elephant. They're coming at it from their own perspectives and vantage points. So if that was a company, it'd be like the finance person going, oh, this feels like, you know, something related to finance without realizing it's the whole elephant. Um, so it's really thinking about something bigger, thinking about, you know, intentionally thinking through causes and effects. And um, it's really the core element of sustainability and circularity. Um, so circular economy actually also integrates lots of different types of disciplines. You've got entrepreneurship and under engineering, there's so many different engineering components because you've got the material side, chemical side, manufacturing side, mechanical, um, supply chains, another huge one as you can see in thinking across value chains, um, marketing, even biology, uh, a lot of circular economy um, projects and uh, some of the work that we've done is around biomimicry. For those of you that are familiar with biomimicry, how do we take things from nature that have that function really well in our system in itself and actually use those in design principles when we're designing solutions. Um, so I'm gonna go through examples so you can see how this, these concepts are actually applied through different areas. So in terms of entrepreneurship, here's some examples of um, early stage companies that are doing some pretty phenomenal work. So this is AFTA and it's a company that, uh, that works with a women's uh, cooperative in Brazil and 
they take fabric left over from Volkswagen and repurpose it into new products. Pinatex, this one's amazing. They actually use pineapple to make fibers. If you think about it, and it's the fiber that they actually make is almost like leather because pineapple is so fibrous. Um, and so they actually, on their website, have their full value chain there. So instead of utilizing leather, they're actually taking what's considered agricultural waste and repurposing it into textiles. Um, this is a favorite of mine um, for many reasons. So it's out of Chicago, it's called The Plant. It's actually a co-working incubator accelerator that houses lots of different circular entities, but it's a closed loop in itself. One company's output becomes an input for another company. Um, and the actual infrastructure and the design and layout of the incubator accelerator is circular also. Viga, so this is an example of a business model where product becomes a service. So instead of um, buying your maternity and baby clothes, they actually rent them. They're only used five or six times. They obviously wash them and send them back and then donate them to different secondary markets after that. Um, this is my favorite. Uh, it's called Bakey's and they basically, they took a really simple concept of plastic utensils and use sorghum flour to um, recreate them in sweet, savory um, flavors. Some have no flavor, they're vegan, they're vegetarian, and they take 30 minutes to dissolve in hot water. Um, it's a company that started out of India, and if you think about the billions and billions of people around the world that use plastic utensils, this is a, a major innovative concept here. Um, GoBox, this is actually, you're starting to see this company expand across the U.S. Um, there are some cities back east that are actually working this into their utility fees to bring it to their city at the municipal level. And uh, as you can see, restaurants use these plastic to-go containers, and you pick up your food, you use the app to figure out where you can return the GoBox, and then GoBox picks them up, washes them, and takes them back to the restaurant. Those plastic clamshells are actually not recyclable in most cities. So it's a, a major waste diverter there. Eco Roof, this is another favorite. So they agricultural waste is massive in the US, right? We mass produce our food, so it creates a massive amount of waste. A lot of the agricultural waste has chemicals on it, so it's very they're very hard to recycle materials. But this company went through um, a patented, they created their own patents and actually turn that plastic agricultural waste into roof, uh, roofing tiles, um, primarily used in the southeastern part of the U.S. Um, also, corporations are taking a circular economy by the horns. Um, lots of companies are designing, uh, redesigning their entities or partnering. So this is an example of a company that I mentioned earlier that partnered across the value chain and actually created a new company. This is called Loop Store. It was started by TerraCycle. For those of you that are familiar with TerraCycle, TerraCycle is actually the company that we ASU sends their blue bags, their blue recycling bags to that you see on campus. Um, TerraCycle partnered with UPS, as you can see in the, the diagram, flow diagram at the top. They partnered with Unilever, P&G, um, several different uh, Bath and Body Works. They also partnered with retailers, where essentially, um, you order your products online, Loop delivers them through UPS to your home, customers use the product, um, then you send actually the, uh, the containers back to Loop, they pick it up in that tote. Um, this is amazing for several reasons. One, that value chain collaboration between TerraCycle, the brands, the haulers, it's also amazing because UPS actually becomes kind of a, a waste management entity by nature, and a legit, like shipping not just products, but actually waste at the end of life. Um, and they are now actually global. Uh, you can order anywhere in the US, but they're actually global um, launched. And they've created an arm for small businesses to actually use the platform also. Um, P&G and Unilever, for example, spent like six figures, seven figures, on investing in designing the packaging that you see in the upper right-hand corner, the stainless steel. 
Um, they designed it in such a way that it actually will wear over time. But if you're a small business, you can actually use the specs from Loop to find containers to actually put your products in and sell through the Loop platform also. Um, Philips, uh, a lot of you might be or should be probably familiar with Philips. Um, they were probably one of the first larger, more established corporations to go circular. Um, they took also the product as a service model. An example of one arm of their operation that they do this in is light bulbs. So now um, instead of selling light bulbs to say airports, they actually offer it as a service and um, maintain all the lighting for airports in different parts of the world. Another area is the public sector. Uh, you saw the example from Risen earlier, but there's a lot of cities, um, not just in Europe, um, but uh, you're starting to see more cities across the U.S. and regions that are actually doing some really amazing things. One example is Pennsylvania. Um, they're doing a statewide initiative, as you can see, that has economic impact on the far left as well as environmental impact, and their programs are on the right there. Um, a lot of the public-based programs in the U.S. is they're using economic development to become a driver, um, really thinking about uh, R&D and how do you accelerate the commercialization and supporting the R&D and tech commercialization and different types of technical assistance and capital. Um, and they actually uh, built, um, City of Phoenix has what's called a resource innovation campus. It's in one location where companies are, they attract companies to locate there that are going to work with various types of materials, plastics, organics, wood, paper, but Pennsylvania took a different approach. And instead of in one place-based area, they've actually distributed it. So the organics recycler, the one that does the compost, is actually co-located with the zoo. For example, the zoo obviously creates a lot of organic waste. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's not publicly run, but it's probably the most efficient um, bottle recycling initiative. Uh, for those of you that are from uh, bottle bill states, um, a lot of states actually have incentives where if you take your bottle, not a lot, actually, there's very few of them, so a lie. Um, that you take your bottle to a location and you get a 10 cents return. Um, Oregon is amazing because it's, actually, it's not publicly run. It's run by a separate nonprofit. And as you can see in the upper left, it has a ton of economic impact, but also a tremendous amount of waste diversion. And the... Um, it's been able to actually create a lot of what, what are called secondary markets of people who are creating startups around this whole uh, recycling cooperative and supporting it also. And that's it. Um, I realize I just gave you uh, an insane amount of information in a short time, um, but I wanted to make sure to allow for enough time for people to also ask questions. Um, I saw them coming, I see them coming in now, um, and feel free to, to shout them out, but I'll kind of go through these on the right side. So Maxwell asked, going forward, do you think that new manufacturing processes or materials would be the most beneficial at, if costs weren't a factor? Absolutely. So there's an organization called Remade out of the Ro Rochester Institute of Technology, and their primary purpose is to redesign manufacturing. Um, and that's something actually our department at Walton is also looking at with a few faculty in engineering, um, especially related to polymers and plastics. And a lot of people are starting to think about redesigning manufacturing, not from the standpoint of these massive industrial facilities, but micro manufacturing that could be distributed um, more broadly with lower CapEx and such. Um, Go box, is there any incentive for customers returning the boxes? Um, so it is a license-based um, uh, service, so you can license it and bring it to your city. I do believe there is some customization um, to that, and I, I'm willing to bet that the incentives would probably change based on region, um, partially related to the culture around recycling. Um, like, for example, at the city in the southeast, there is no incentive other than you already pay for it in your utility bill. Um, John asked, how are customer and user of product needs factor into designing a closed loop system? Alicia. Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Your flow is Please. just on point. <laughs> no, I, before, I, 
I'd really love for uh, some of these folks who are asking questions to uh, potentially chime totally. in with some additional uh, context or clarifying points. Uh, but before yeah. we do, I've learned that uh, it, it, uh, it's always good to stop the recording. So we're going to end the recorded aspect of Make It Happen. And then, Alicia, if you're willing to stick around and with yeah. engage in this Q&A, we'd really appreciate it. So on behalf of everybody here, thank, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. And, and most of all, thanks uh, to Alicia Marseille for sharing her wisdom in this uh, domain of circular economy and why it matters to innovators these days. So give her a round of applause. There she is, ladies and gentlemen.